Hey, it's Tacosis, and welcome back to the show, Ronnie Pontiac. Hello, Ronnie. Hi, thank you for having me back. Uh, real pleasure, real honor. Uh, the things that, that I say that make me sound like a, a liar every time, but I, I never am because we have the best guests. So uh, that's why it really is a pleasure to be to be speaking to you again. And, and of course, we were talking about uh, your recent book last time, but you have a more recent book that you did together with Latamra Lucid, and um, we're going to dive right into it. Uh, you know, there's life is short, right? Memento more, you know, a meteorite might uh, hit the earth at any second. So we don't have time for intros. People should already know who you are. Uh, if they don't, you know, watch the previous show, uh, uh, go out there, uh, uh, ingest uh, Ronnie's uh, work, you know, buy the book we talked about last time, definitely buy this book. So what I really want to, your, your new book is about the Orphic Hymns. But instead of starting there, you know, I could start with the question, what are the Orphic Hymns? But instead, I was wondering if, if we could talk about Orpheus and, and Orphism. Um, so I was wondering if you could tell us who Orpheus was. And of course, he's probably not a historical person, or maybe he was, or maybe there's a historical core. But yeah, myths are more real than real people. They're more real than history. So so tell us who Orpheus was, and like his, his mythical biography, at least. Okay. Well, he's part of the, allegedly, the first novel in Western civilization, which is uh, the story of Jason and the Argonauts. In fact, there was an Orphic Argonautica where Orpheus was the star, but the famous one, of course, is the one with Jason. And Orpheus did things like his song was more powerful than the song of the sirens. He was able to uh, bring peace to the crew when they were angry at each other. He would figure out which god was angry. So when there was an earthquake, he could tell that this was the footsteps of Apollo and that Apollo demanded that a temple be built on this land. And he also supposedly created mystery cults in every place that they stopped and would create these cults not only for the Greek gods, but even for the gods of Asia Minor. So uh, gods that he wasn't particularly familiar with, he was still able to create these sacred rites for. And then Orpheus, the Orpheus myth has several levels to it. Uh, that is Orpheus uh, sort of as the uh, first rock star on the first tour bus on the trip to get the Golden Fleece. And there's another Orpheus who is the uh, man who has fallen in love mm -hmm. and who is about to be married. But unfortunately, a satyr or sometimes it's a human being who's a shepherd who's jealous and falls in love with her and lust with her because of her beauty chases her. And, and she runs from him, realizing that he's trying to assault her. And she is bitten by a poisonous serpent. And she falls and lifeless. And Orpheus is heartbroken by this. So he decides to go to the underworld where the dead are, into Hades. And he plans to sing for Hades and for Persephone, hoping that they will free Eurydice because of this injustice. This is, of course, a very awkward situation because Hades had, had abducted Persephone. So it's a little strange to be coming down there and asking Hades to release a woman who suffered the same fate. And he sang songs as he, as he walked down into the world of the dead. And there's wonderful stories about it that Sisyphus, for example, stopped rolling the rock up uh, that the Furies suddenly became reflective and calm as they listened, and that all the dead gathered round him. And when he sang for Persephone and Orpheus, he was so moving that they granted his wish. And they would allow Eurydice to follow him back to the world and live out her life if, and only if, he did not look back. He must trust in Hades until she reached the sunlight. But if he looked back before, the deal was off. And so many great poets have described this, including operas and all sorts of art, this, this journey back to the world where he, he can hear her footsteps. He wants to look desperately to see her, but he does turn a little too soon when she's still half in shadow and he only sees her long enough to see her disappear. Now, later, Plato said that, that she was never there, that Hades had sent 
a phantasm as a punishment of this impudent mortal that dared to come down into the underworld and ask for a soul, an exception to natural law. Well, Orpheus was was really heartbroken. And so he started to sing at dawn to Apollo, to the sun as it rose every morning. And Apollo taught him the secrets of all religions or other versions of the myths that he was taught by his mother, Calliope, and that his grandmother was memory. Or another version of the myth that he was taught in ancient Egypt. And so, and then of course, Madame Blavatsky thought that Orpheus was Hindu. We really don't know. We have no clue if there ever was an Orpheus. But supposedly, at that point, the Thracian men among whom he was existing uh, were so interested in what he was learning from Apollo and in this, this every morning, this ritual he was doing to the rising sun that they gathered with him. And he started this religion, which was a reformation of the religion of Dionysus. And the religion of Dionysus was like this intrusion of the irrational into ancient Greece. It was heavy intoxication. And sometimes there were very bloody sacrifices and people covering themselves in the blood of sacrificed bulls. And in, as in Euripides, sometimes human beings died, especially men who spied on the secret proceedings of the women initiates. And it was a pretty wild religion. And Dionysus himself was a, a very un-Olympian deity, even though he was the son of Zeus. He was a god of wine. He had very long hair. He was kind of effeminate. He was uh, really there to, to have a good time and was surrounded by a constant party in a sense. And, and then apparently traveled around spreading his religion this way. And there's a famous play by uh, Euripides uh, called the Bacoi about uh, how, of course, Pentheus is a very manly man who runs this, this city and Dionysus shows up and he imprisons him. But in the end, Pentheus is made the fool of and is even sacrificed. His own mother kills him. So this wild religion was very disturbing to the Greeks. And, and yet it was popular. The women in particular liked it because it gave them an opportunity to have some power and to get away from this smothering kind of uh, very male-friendly but not so female-friendly society of ancient Greece. The women could all exist together up in the mountains and sort of have these wonderful uh, vacations <laughs> away from their families. As part of the as the part of the religion, and so the story was that Orpheus reformed this religion, and one of the things he did was that he introduced supposedly, allegedly, the idea of reincarnation, and he taught people that if you eat meat, you may be eating the body of someone who was once very dear to you in another life, hmm. and he also was nonviolent. Now, you can imagine in, in ancient Greece, where not too long ago they were holding up the Olympian ideal of heroes like Achilles, and they wanted their men to be meat eaters, and they sacrificed animals. And, and we should also remember that the animal sacrifices were really like big barbecues, because the people would eat a great deal of the meat. Uh, most of what was given to the gods was, were things that the, that the people didn't want to eat in most of the uh, religions. But... The idea was that we were we were thanking them and sharing with them the wonderful smells of this barbecue and that the animals that sacrificed were killed in the glory of the gods, and now we all get to eat. So it wasn't that much different from our own habits, except that there was a sacred side to it, that this was not just killing for food. And this was taken away by, by Orpheus, who didn't want you eating meat at all, and he didn't want you to be a hero like Achilles. He wanted you to be nonviolent. And to, to be able to be pure and indeed to be purified and peaceful so that you could enter into the afterlife and not be tiled to, uh, tied to the wheel of necessity, to be born over and over again because of your unjust acts, which does sound a lot like, like Hindu religion. It's probably part of the reason why Madame Blavatsky thought that he was Hindu. So later he became known as the great musician and it's funny because in ancient Greece, he really wasn't known for music. He was known as somebody who founded religions and somebody who was an expert on sacred matters, on the teletai, the hymns. They're, they're really called the teletai, which means uh, something that having to do with ripening. Uh, it's like a, a, a ritual of ripening. And so he was about ripening souls. 
his myth continued. Uh, the Romans really loved the, the don't look back story and the loss of his love. And uh, Virgil and Ovid wrote about it very romantically, romanticized it. Virgil, kind of funny, he made Eurydice kind of scold Orpheus before she disappeared. Like, you idiot. How could you do that? We could have been together. And, uh, and then Eurydice, of course, over many, many centuries, uh, evolves in the hands of writers and artists. She begins as somebody that we know nothing about. She has no voice, no description, only a name. And, and she winds up being given a voice, especially in the 20th century, by female writers who kind of turned her on her ear. There's one hilarious and wonderful poem about uh, Eurydice where, where she's, she's saying, oh, my God, he's come down here to get me. And he's pitching a poem and I'm the prize. And she's like, can I get away from this guy? It's very funny. But um, Orpheus himself in the medieval time became known as Sir Orpheo. And he was like this heroic knight who had a tragic love. And this worked its way into theater and ultimately into opera. And the amazing thing is how often Orpheus has returned in cinema and painting and sculpture and in, in every art, poetry, the famous poems by uh, Rilke, the wonderful German poet called the Sonnets of Orpheus. And he just continually comes back as this myth of great importance to people. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think we're going to talk more about that. But you mentioned him establishing mystery cults every place that he stopped, you know, all around the, the ancient Mediterranean and perhaps yes. even further. So can you tell us what is a mystery cult? Yeah. Um, in in ancient Greece, but also in other parts of the world, these mystery cults were sort of, they were religions, essentially. But the the cult was built around usually a yearly festival, an initiatory festival. The most famous were the Eleusinian Mysteries. And some people believed for quite some time that the Orphic hymns were sung as part of the Eleusinian Mysteries. But this has never been proven. We don't really know what happened, but there's many theories, including the ideas that they were taking psychoactive substances. But we have descriptions of uh, the, the kinds of changes that they wrought in people's lives, apparently when you experienced the Eleusinian mysteries, you were convinced of the afterlife and you lived as a more moral person. Uh, Plutarch, the great biographer, writes about being initiated into the mysteries of Orpheus. And he says that, that there was a lot of running around in the dark and, and a lot of frightful experiences. And in the end, you felt that you would die for sure. But then all of a sudden, the light opened and you were led out into these beautiful fields with flowers in them. And, and that, that you were taught all the secrets and that this was what life was like. Life was running around in this dark cavern and then you would be released upon death. Your soul would be free into the fields. And so the, uh, they were all a little bit different. We don't really know much detail about them. They were also different in the sense that for the Eleusinian mysteries, you could go once and be saved. You would have the experience, it would change you, it would wake you up to your soul, and then you, you might never go back again. You would just live the awakened life. But the Orphic mysteries, the Orphic cult demanded that you, you be an Orphic every day. So you had to not eat meat, you had to be nonviolent, you had to practice certain types of purity and, so, and the certain rituals. Now, there is some argument about what these cults actually were and what the Orpheus stuff actually was. So I'll give you a brief example. Um, for a long time, there were scholars arguing that the Orphic church was a church. It was like a pre-existing uh, prototype of the Christian church and that the, there was a wheel in it that you would be as spun on and this would, they'd let you go after you spun on the wheel and you'd be staggering around and this was what it was like to spin through space as a soul losing itself in incarnation. And they even, some people even argued that the idea of Jesus on the cross was inspired by the Orphic wheel. And so uh, the idea was, for instance, that there were many names that were shared. Orpheus was called the Good Shepherd, for example, and was often shown surrounded by tamed animals. And so the idea was that there was this big religion, people went there, and we have. We have references of people attending some sort of regular Orphic rites. But we have no evidence of a huge church at all. And in fact, 
in the mid 20th century, scholars like Linforth and Guthrie argued that there really might, might not be anything Orphic except literature. That the whole idea that this was anything more than literature is just an illusion based on the literature itself trying to present itself as a, as a set of uh, litanies and such for some kind of a church. And there were also people that were arguing that these were frauds, and Plato was one of them, and, and so were some of the greatest Greek writers who complained about these Orphic priests who are reminiscent in some ways of, of, of uh, unethical spiritualists who would find out where rich people had died and then would show up at the door and say, you know, unless your relative had the rights, that they're, they're not going to go to the Elysian fields, to the nice place. They're going to go to a really bad place, Tartarus, where it's all muddy and horrible and hot. But if you buy this from me and I, you let me do a ritual, he's going to be great. And so will the whole family. And so there's a famous joke about uh, one of these Orphics coming up to a Spartan king and saying, uh, saying, you know, you really need me to teach you about the afterlife and how wonderful it is. The afterlife is so much better than the world that we live in. And the Spartan king says, well, what are you waiting for? Yeah. <laughs> um, in, in Orphism too, like you mentioned, you mentioned Bacchus, Dionysius. Was, wasn't there a, a myth that, that they taught that, you know, the human beings come from you know, the god Dionysius is devoured by, by the evil titans? And uh, Zeus strikes strikes the Titans dead, and human beings arise basically from the soot. So we're a combination of these these monstrous Titans who kind of the, their remains uh, keep keep the soul of Dionysus Dionysius in bondage. Is, is that part of Orphism? Uh, well, again, that's argued about. It, that myth has at times been argued as the central myth of Orphism. That that the whole point of Orphic cult is to purify us from the Titans. The Titans representing these out of control, very primitive natural forces that that are jealous of the gods, of the power of the gods, and they they want to dethrone them, and they are instinctively destructive and envious and and in every way uh, an enemy of creation, and and the, yes, that we as human beings are partially made up of their flesh, uh, mixed with the lightning of Zeus and with the soul of Dionysus. And so Apollo was said to be the savior of Dionysus because at the center of the Orphic religion was Apollo going and retrieving each piece of Dionysus' soul, the tears of Dionysus, they sometimes call them. So each of us is a tear of Dionysus and Apollo saves us. He liberates the Dionysus in us. And so there's the famous Orphic formula, I am a child of earth and of starry heaven but my race is of heaven. Yeah. You know, I, I particularly had to bring that myth up because I think a lot of people watching, listening, were familiar with Gnosticism, Kabbalah, you know, this idea of, of sort of a, the shattering of a god into little pieces that is held in bondage by by malignant spiritual forces, right? You know, that, that sounds kind of like a predecessor to some forms of Kabbalah and, and classical Gnosticism. Mm -hmm. Um can you tell us more about about some of these important myths? And and really, you know, you, you gave us that, that mythical biography of Orpheus, but I'm sure lots of people listening, you know, their their spidey senses are going off, their esoteric spidey senses being like, well, there's there's something to this story that that is speaking to me. Can you tell me about some of the the inner meanings of, of the of this myth? And and I know that that could be a whole show there, and it's meanings with an S, right? Because all good myths have you know many different esoteric interpretations that change and grow and reflect. And as you mentioned, there's different versions of these myths as well. But it, but if you could give us some of these these more esoteric inner meanings of of these important uh, uh, Orphic uh, mysteries and, and mythology, yes. Uh, I, before going into that, I should point out that there are some who believe that Pythagoras was the creator of much of the Orphic mystery. Uh, and there was a reference to somebody named Orpheus of Croton in the ancient writing. And of course, Croton is where uh, Pythagoras had his school. So some believe that, that Pythagoras signed the name Orpheus to Orpheus Orphic writings. These are some big similarities, including vegetarianism, the interest in numbers and in harmony yep. and the use of the music in order to convey esoteric ideas. 
Others say that Pythagoras learned from Orpheus, learned about the mysteries of numbers from those from that mystic school, and then he developed it into a more reformed approach of philosophy that we know as Pythagoreanism, but we don't really know what the order there was. Now, at the heart of both, and to address your question, is the idea of numbers as, as a mystical order. And again, you spoke of Kabbalah, so we see, again, a similarity there, that in Orphic ideas, music and the, the differences between notes were a secret to everything from the planets to how our, our organs function together. So this magic number seven that we find in the seven notes before an octave is repeated, right? And so there were harmonious sounds that were produced by certain intervals, and there were disharmonious sounds by others. And so the harmonious were thought to represent the good and the beautiful and the true, while the disharmonious represented a, a kind of alienation from that and a fall into the more titanic world. And we see this reflected, for example, in Plato, where Plato argues that there are certain types of music and certain types of songs that are just bad because they arouse lust or the desire to kill. And that's that music should be forbidden. Yeah, Only go back. uplifting yeah. music should ex yeah. should be, you know, listened to. So this also relates, of course, to architecture and proportion. And and everything was said to involve harmony. So as this this purveyor of music that even the dead and that wild animals would be hypnotized by. Orpheus represented, I think in some way, the soul itself, right? The, the purified soul, uh, harmonizing everything in the body, for example. Uh, what brings harmony into our body? Our bodies are made of all of this, this, this. We have to every day put more stuff in it to keep making ourselves. And, and, they, and all this stuff is sort of pulling away from us uh, trying to get back into uh, entropy and, and falling into disorder. But something keeps it harmonized and sustains it through time. And, and that is said to be the eternity of the soul. And the soul brings harmony and light like Apollo. And so Orpheus was teaching then how to recognize our own souls through the symbol of this god of music, Apollo. And so we are to find harmony and proportion in everything that we do in life. And so there are, there are many, many other aspects of, of the Orphic myth and of the mysteries of the numbers in that myth. Uh, it gets quite complicated in the hands of the Neoplatonists, especially Proclus, who goes at great depth into creation, and just like Plato did. And, and Plato is very Orphic. I mean, for somebody who writes about the Orphics in a very negative way, he is very Orphic, and Bertrand Russell, uh, during his earlier career, when he was very interested in, in these matters, uh, wrote that he thought that, uh, that Orpheus, in fact, he was one of those to put forth that, that Orpheus reformed the religion of uh, Dionysus, and that, uh, that Pythagoras reformed the religion of Orpheus. And then he said, that Orpheus informed Plato to such an extent, and that Plato informed Western religious philosophy to such an extent, that Orpheus has been absolutely saturated throughout Western esotericism. And he does appear over and over again. So when you look at every time there's a cultural renaissance or a spiritual counterculture, Orpheus seems to pop up again. When the Rosicrucians were having their revolution or attempted revolution in Europe, they, he, there he was, uh, Frederick Palatine, the, the leader of the, of the Rosicrucian side politically. Uh, he dressed up in a, as Orpheus in a presentation uh, that he did in a mask. They would have these wonderful kind of theatrical presentations that were messages about their intentions. And he, they had one about the Golden Fleece that was a real threat to the emperor. And, but in it, he played Orpheus. Uh, Orpheus appears in the Rosicrucian manifestos. Mm -hmm. And Orpheus is in much alchemical writing. There, there are references that come up to Orpheus. Um, and so there are many esoteric mysteries there, but the biggest to me is what this connection is with Renaissance and Orpheus. 
It's something that was recognized by Marsilio Ficino, who sometimes is called the father of the Renaissance, a Catholic priest who said that there was no magic more powerful than the Orphic hymns and practiced them regularly, had, had a, uh, a lute with Orpheus painted on it and performed the hymns with his friends and talked about how powerful their magic was. And it's so strange when you, when you start to actually follow it through history, which we do in the book, and see how it arises again and again. So, for example, in, it revolutionized music when Orpheus was uh, made a subject of opera and became one of the most popular of all operas because of the backward glance that was told again and again. And then there was a revolution because somebody decided that story is a bummer. Let's make, let's make it a happy ending. He gets her back. And, and then people went nuts. I loved it. And it, it, suddenly it was all happy endings in opera instead of tragic endings for a while. And so Orpheus uh, even comes back with interest in, in the 1960s when there was a band called Orpheus. And people like Jim Morrison strayed into Orphic territories and I had a very interesting conversation with uh, once with Patricia Keenley Morrison, who was his pagan bride, and she told me about how they they would uh, sing the Orphic hymns or, or or read them out to each other, and uh, so there is this this kind of uh, vivifying quality to the hymns that's hard to explain. Yeah, and to, to, so like you know, Orphism and its its heritage, it's not this. This ancient thing that was influential then, it is, you know, curious to to weirdos like us, but it's this, this important thing that keeps coming up again and again, uh, in important cultural and, uh, as you even said, political, uh, artistic movements, you know, for, throughout the last couple thousands of years. Is that right? Yes, that's absolutely yeah. right. Yeah. And there's a way in which it, again, you can see that, that when you're dealing with a society that is autocratic, militaristic, uh, and abusive to to women, to to people who represent the female gender, even to animals. And then there comes a time when there's a sort of awakening of people who they want to bring compassion. They want uh, women and minorities and animals to have have more rights and to be treated better. Oh, there's Orpheus almost inevitably showing up. And, and people start to talk about it and, or, or they recast him in some artistic way or refer to him. And, and he was the ultimate in counterculture because uh, if you read Aristophanes' The Clouds, which I highly recommend everyone, hilarious uh, takedown of Socrates and idealism in general. Um, but in it, we're dealing with uh, some definite criticism of Orphism when he describes this hostility toward the, the way that Orphism makes these young men who are supposed to want to be virile soldiers into uh, aesthetics who have very strict diets and were very concerned about purity. And so they're being, their masculinity is being destroyed in, according to these, these cultures like ancient Greece, where that was considered a big problem. The Orphic influence was a real issue there because it was making it difficult to wage the wars that the culture had been based on. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, you've mentioned the Orphic Hymns a few times, and I haven't even said the title of the book, which is The Magic of the Orphic Hymns. Hey, Roddy, big question. What are the Orphic Hymns? That is also something that is argued hotly. It, they are They have several different potential origins. Back in the day, they were thought to be very ancient pagan hymns. Uh, they thought the ancient Greeks thought that Orpheus lived in the generation right before the Trojan War. And the idea was that he set these hymns down as the sacred hymns for the Greek gods. And all the Greek gods are in those hymns, including some gods from Asia Minor. And so the hymns are rather, as we have them, are rather formulaic. And they don't have a lot of detail about the individual gods. They repeat a lot of formulas because the priests that would be performing them were very well versed in, in the characteristics and the sacred objects and such associated. The let's call it the correspondences associated with any any particular god. And one of the things that we did for this version was we we put the correspondences back in the hymns so that that we can understand uh, what they were talking about in these formulas, kind of unpack them for the reader. And so 
the hymns were meant to be what they called teletai, supposedly, which were a way to ripen the soul. And the way that they read in one level is very much like turning to to every direction you can think of, to every everything represented in the world by a god, and finding the holiness in it, giving respect to it, and appreciating it. And so by the time you've done this, you've done something like a highly complex uh, indigenous American ritual to the four directions. You're blessing everything, including death and sleep and dreams and, and all, every aspect of human life is represented in there. And so for a long time, people thought that that's the purpose, that these, these hymns were performed in these mysteries in order to bring you into alignment with the gods. You were literally being harmonized with each hymn, with the deity that was being invoked. And then by the end of it, you had harmonized with the whole pantheon of deities, which has to be a very powerful experience. And so now the thing is, is that really what it was? Because along came more modern scholarship and people noticed, gee, this doesn't read like it's ancient Greek. It reads more like it came from the era of the Neoplatonists, and it reflects a lot of ideas that the Neoplatonists held. So the theory came up that maybe it was it was actually a Neoplatonic uh, kind of invention, and and then there was also a reference, a couple of references in ancient writing to the idea that Onomacritus who was a writer of, of sacred oracles during the time of the uh, Greek tyrant, Athenian tyrant, uh, Pisistratus, that he was a uh, guy who he gathered the hymns together and he changed them and they, they called him a plagiarizer because of it. And, and But he was trying to make this into a religion that would kind of work together. And it was similar to Homer in the sense that all of these gods belong to different cities. They, they, they weren't yeah. part of a family. Yeah. And so now we put, we put them all together, brothers or sisters, there's a father, there's a mother, and we all get together. We're all Greeks now. So all the gods are together in, in Olympus and in these, these hymns. But then there is also evidence that they may have been created in Rome um, in the 4th or 5th century A.D., uh, during the Severan dynasty. Uh, this was the time when there were the four Julias, these four amazing Syrian women who ran Rome for a couple of decades. And and they were real uh, a boon to, to culture and to society in general. For example, uh, Domna, who was the, the leader of, of the Julias, the eldest and the most powerful, she was the empress of Rome. She had this... Uh, amazing way of, of bringing about advances in society. So it's said that, that under her guidance, the revolution in jurisprudence that occurred in Rome that became the foundation for all European jurisprudence and even for jurisprudence today was created in her court. Uh, the writing of Galen, who was the main authority for medicine for over a thousand years, was created in her court. Uh, the Golden Ass of Apuleius, uh, a great satirical novel, her court. The story of Apollonius of Tyana by Philostratus in her court. And so some modern scholars theorize that, that the hymns were pulled together in her court as well, and that this was actually a banquet. Now, it's a very interesting argument why they say this, because if you look at the arrangement of the hymns, there's a lot of beauty and excitement. There's even a little bit of eroticism as you're going along, and then and then it gets it gets dark and deep, and 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 then all of a sudden it, it kind of winds up like, okay, time to sober up, and and the hymns that come at you then are kind of the kind of thing that would sober you up, and so they speculate that these things may have simply been performed in these great overnight banquets. Um, by these intellectual, creative people that were gathered around Domna. We don't really know what they are. Uh, some people feel they're more Asia Minor than Greece in terms of their content. But what they seem to function as is this way of attunement, this harmonizing. Marsilio Ficino felt that very strongly 
And he also, he said that they were such powerful magic because, I mean, he had this great quote um, about them. He said, I learned from Orpheus that love existed and that it held the keys to the whole world. The whole power of magic consists in love. Right. That's a big statement. It's a weird statement coming from a Catholic priest also. But it was this guy who was behind the translations of Plato and the Hermetica and all this material that really created the Renaissance. And the way that all started was he got his hands on these things, but he didn't have the time or the place to work on them. And so in frustration and doubt as to whether he'd ever be able to take on the task, he um, performed musically the hymn to the cosmos. And he finished and then almost immediately received a letter from Cosimo de Medici telling him, I heard you want to do these translations. I'm giving you a house and a village and you're going to you're going to do these translations for us. And so this moved Ficino deeply that the hymn was answered from his point of view. And and so he performed them always uh, after that. There's also a lovely story about uh, the Neoplatonic philosopher Proclus that he loved the hymns and that when he was he was dying, he was losing his senses and he didn't recognize his friends. He didn't know who he was. But when they sang the Orphic hymns, he knew the words. Ah, yeah, that is lovely. Um, so what what moved you and, and Tamra to, to put out this book? Well, uh, when I'm, we worked for Manly Hall, one of the last things that happened when we were still working for him, the last job that I did for him was a republication of Thomas Taylor's translation of the Orphic hymns. Mm-hmm. And, and we were fascinated by them. And it was also just something because it, he was pushing us out of there for our own good but we didn't want to go. So we were kind of clinging to it like a life raft and, and trying to you know, really get into it. And so I decided to do a translation because I was faced with a necessity of uh, taking language at college. And I had the opportunity to study ancient Greek. And I was the only person that wanted to do it. So I was able to study it in the backyard garden of my professor. It was just wonderful. And, and having began, you know, I, I could now read a Greek grammar. I could read the Little and Scott Dictionary. And I, I decided I want to do my own translations of these things. I, I want to see what they would be like outside Thomas Taylor's rather torturous translations. And so uh, we worked on them together. And the first version that we did, we decided to softly sing at our window. We had this one window facing outside. And we lived in the middle of Hollywood in this urban setting. And we just thought, let's just do these things. And in this setting, it's only nature we have on a daily basis. And we did everything we could. Um, we, you know, we didn't drink. We didn't take drugs. We, we were trying to be pure and like the Orphics would want you to be. And then we performed them one at a time. And there were weird experiences, just weird synchronicities where, uh, just give you a couple examples. When we did the hymn to Athena, in this urban setting, a big owl landed on a tree that was immediately outside our window. And then when we finished the hymn, swooped toward the window and then away. Um, when we did the hymn to Aphrodite, there was a couple uh, walking by and they stopped right underneath the window and kissed. Just little things like that, <laughs> weird things that, that if we hadn't both been there, we would have thought we were, go- we were losing our minds. And we don't know. I, we don't really know what it was. We're not saying that we invoked anything or that the gods were manifesting. We don't know what that was. But whatever it was, it was fascinating. And so that put us. We, we thought we should treat this with more respect, and and so we started to research more deeply. She went way into what the traditional attributions for the gods were, what kinds of things were associated with them, and I went deeply into the history. And lucky for us. Beginning really in the late 1990s, there was a huge revolution in Orphic studies, and Orpheus has been written about more in the last 20 years than probably ever in history. And there are more translations, actually, of the Orphic hymns at this time than there ever have been in English. And ours is a little different in that 
we did bring back these attributions and try to give you a poetic feeling for what the deity represents in, in this great pageant of life. And, you know, as musicians, you know, uh, the people, if you don't know Lucid Nation, stop what you're doing and listen, to put on some Lucid Nation. Like, do, do you have a, a special relationship to Orpheus, a special relationship to these hymns, do you feel? Yeah, definitely. Uh, for one thing, that we had a weird experience when we first did them, um, which was that um, I had this guitar, this black guitar, and Tamara pasted all these little beads and things on it to make it look like a galaxy, like all these stars and planets. It was just beautiful. And and so at the same time, a friend of ours sent us this uh, famous uh, woodcut called uh, Orpheus Plays the Vejuelo, which is a very early form of guitar. And it was from 1500 something. Now, when it arrived was during the L.A. riots. And so where we were, you could see fire all around us, these columns of flames. And when we saw the, the drawing, it, it was this guy with long, wavy hair playing a guitar with stars on it with columns of fire all around him in the distance. And we just went, OK, that's weird. And... Uh, <laughs> That's before we actually got into doing them and experienced the other synchronicities. So right there, we felt like this was speaking to us at a very personal level. But then also, certainly as musicians, we were fascinated by the power of, of music in the mystical sense and in the way that, that music could convey these esoteric secrets. Now, I cannot, I want to warn your listeners that if you do go check out our music, you will hear catharsis and and a lot of um, of amazing female poetry by our lead singer who uh, is describing life very accurately from the point of view of a woman of that era and time. Uh, we were mostly recording in the 1990s and early 2000s, so it's pretty aggressive. It, it, once in a while, we went about putting esotericism in it or capturing moods that were intended to convey more meditative frames of mind and states and, uh, and sometimes I even got to sing here and there. My songs are usually a little bit more accessible, but um, we definitely learned even that idea of catharsis from we were reading all the stuff about Dionysus. We'd started with Nietzsche and then we got into some other works. Da uh, Alain Danielou was a problematic guy, but an amazing writer on the subject. And, and we were really looking at that idea of music as catharsis, as as a way of confronting issues in self and society. And we happened to fall into the Riot Girl movement, which was a perfect place for that kind of activity. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Roddy Popiak, it's uh, been amazing. The name of the book, again, is The Magic of the uh, Orphic Hymns. So go to innertraditions.com, buy your copy. Uh, and you, you, in the book, like, do you explain like kind of how to use them, what to do with them, how to bring them into your life? Yeah, and, and we can, I mean, I want to make sure that everybody understands that they can simply be enjoyed yeah. as literature. They're beautiful poet poems, I think. I mean, they, they just, they move people, and they certainly moved us when we wrote them, and still do. Every time we've done them, we, we were moved by them. And so, at the same time, they can be ritual. And so, I would say, do as we did. Just let yourself be moved. If you don't feel like singing, you don't have to. If you do, great. Now, we have a friend who's setting them to uh, very advanced composition choral music. Um, so it, it, you can do whatever it moves you to do. I think that's the essence of it in a way. In a way. But if you want to experience the Pacino style, things happen when I do this, I definitely suggest singing. And you don't have to be a musician. You can make your own little sing-song melody up. It isn't anything that requires uh, too much specificity. I don't, not from our experience anyway. Amazing. Okay, and uh, we we had a, a brief discussion uh, off air about the the evils of mammon. Uh, uh, on, on that topic, uh, patreoncom slash gnostic uh, for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month, you can uh, help uh, help keep us going. You can uh, set it so it's just a buck. We give you early access to the shows. I'm always trying to figure out how to give our patrons more. Uh, PayPal.me slash Gnostic for one-time donations. Uh, thanks again, Ronnie. Everybody go out buy the book. Thank Bye. you. Bye.